All right, welcome to FACT's webinar called Understanding Farm Animal Welfare Certification. I am Larissa McKenna, FACT's Humane Farming Program Director, and I also director of our Fund a Farmer project. I will be moderating the webinar today. Thank you all so much for joining us. So just a few introductions before we launch into the presentation. Food Animal Concerns Trust, or FACT, is a national nonprofit organization. We are headquartered in Chicago, and we promote the safe and humane production of milk, meat, and eggs. I also, like I mentioned, direct uh, FACT's Fund a Farmer project, which awards grants and facilitates peer-to-peer -peer education for farmers to increase the number of animals that are raised humanely. And this webinar is part of our Humane Farming webinar series. Also joining me from FACT is Chelsea Paraga, our Program and Development Associate. Um, welcome to Chelsea. At this time, I'm delighted to introduce our two presenters this morning or afternoon. Uh, first, I have Kara Shannon, the Manager of Farm Animal Welfare at the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, ASPCA, and Jamie Runner, from the former Food and Agriculture Clinic Director at Vermont uh, Vermont Law School. So we're very lucky to have both of them today to talk about their new Farm Animal Welfare Certification Guide. Um, <laughs> they will also be available to answer your questions later in the webinar. For, so for now, without further ado, Kara and Jamie, please take it away. I will also mention I do hear some sirens in the background, but that might be unavoidable. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> that's unavoidable. Okay. <laughs> new York City. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that intro, though, Arissa. Um, Jamie and I are both really excited to be here talking to all of you today about welfare certification. So let's dive right in and hope that the siren shines quickly. Um, we're going to start with just a little bit of background information about both of our organizations, the ASPCA and the Center for Agriculture and Food Systems, which is also known as CAF. So the ASPCA is the oldest animal welfare organization in the country. Um, we were founded in New York City in 1866. And we initially formed actually to address the conditions for working horses in the city, but we have obviously expanded since then, and we now work on a number of animal issues, including farm animal welfare. Uh, we have regional offices across the country in addition to our New York City headquarters, and we travel frequently to engage with the farming community. Our broad organizational message, uh, mission is to provide effective means for the prevention of cruelty to animals. And in the farm context, what this really means is working to ensure that more farm animals live under better welfare standards. And now I'm going to hand it over to Jamie to tell you a little bit about CAF. Hi there. Uh, this is Jamie Renner. Um, as Larissa mentioned, until very recently, I was a professor at Vermont Law School's Center for Agriculture and Food Systems, which uh, calls itself CAF. And CAFS has a two-part mission. Uh, first, it teaches law and master's students about food and agriculture law and policy. And second, CAFS students and faculty collaborate uh, with other nonprofits to produce educational and advocacy resources that are meant to help improve the food system, uh, much like our collaboration with the ASPCA on this guide. Thanks, Jamie. Um, so now, before we get started, I just want to give everyone a bit of a roadmap for what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we're going to start with kind of an overview of the certification guide that we and um, the law school came out with together and what's in that guide. Uh, then we're going to move on to why we decided to feature the three certifications that we do feature in the guide. Then we're going to talk a little bit about the business, the business benefits of certification. And then Jamie is going to walk us through what the certification process looks like and all the steps involved there. And then we're going to bring it back, and I'm going to talk a bit about some of the funding opportunities that are available for farmers who are interested in certification and are generally higher welfare um, farming. And then, of course, we're going to end with a little question and answer. Uh, so I'll jump right in. Um, just at the outset, I just wanted to remind everyone, if you haven't already looked at the guide and downloaded it, it is available online. It's on the ASPCA website, ASPCA.org slash farm certification. So just get that out there now so everyone knows where to find it. Um, so the guide starts with just a brief description of, of the three certifications um, and talks a little bit about the business benefits of certification, which we're going to be talking about today. 
Um, but then it also has these really helpful comparison charts that kind of help you visually look at the differences between the three programs. So the first of those is this quick compare chart that looks at kind of the more administrative logistical differences between the three programs, things like cost, the kinds of species that they cover. Um, and then there's these really great species-specific standards comparisons that let you look species by species what the different standards requirements look like for each certification program. So for example, if you're raising beef cattle, you can go right to that quick compare chart and look and see how the standards differ between those three certification programs. Also a really great feature of this guide that we won't be talking about today, but which I really encourage everyone to take a look at on their own, is we've got these farmer case studies. Um, and we've got two case studies for each certification program from farmers across the country, and they really offer a lot of great insight into what it, what it really means to go through this process of certification. And you can learn how some of these other farmers have harnessed the marketing power that you get from being certified. After these case studies, the guide has, again, this list of different available funding sources for farmers, which we will be talking about today. Um, and finally, it ends with some helpful tips about the uh, federal labeling requirements for products, which we won't be talking about today, so if that's something that interests you, again, I definitely encourage you to check out the guide. So why Animal Welfare Foods Certified Humane and the Global Animal Partnership? So we chose to feature these certifications in the guide based on a number of important characteristics that they all possess, which ultimately result in there being really robust, credible um, programs. The first of these is transparency. It's really important that certifications are transparent about their standards so that any you know, interested person has the opportunity to dive in and really see what it means for a farm to be certified. What standards are they actually having to follow to get that, that stamp? And without this transparency, certifications really lose a lot of the value that they would offer consumers otherwise. So all three of the certifications that are featured in the guide have completely transparent standards that are publicly available, they're online for anyone who wants to read them, they can. Uh, the second characteristic is something that we've kind of called rigor, and that has two parts. The first is that the standards of the programs themselves are significantly higher than conventional industry standards, and the second is that the standards are fully enforced. All three certifications covered in the guide require kind of as a baseline that animals are raised in cage-free, enriched environments. Um, the three programs really represent a spectrum of higher welfare conditions, again, starting at this enriched indoor system that both Certified Humane and the GAP programs have standards for, uh, all the way up to the outdoor pasture-based system, which all three have standards for. Um, the programs, again, they require 100% compliance with those standards, and that compliance is determined during the annual on-farm um, audit. And these audits, again, are performed by independent parties to ensure that they're objectives and that there are some mechanisms in place that would address any non-compliances that might come up. And then finally, uh, another characteristic that all three of these programs share, kind of a straightforward one, is just simply that they're available for farmers across the country um, and they're going to be applicable to all types of climates, whether you're in a warmer uh, or colder climate. All three of the certifications would work for you. So now that we've talked a little bit about why we've chosen these three certifications and why they're considered meaningful, credible certifications, we can get more into the reasons for becoming welfare certified. Uh, welfare certifications enable farmers to communicate their commitment to farm animal welfare in a way that's ultimately going to benefit their business. <laughs> more and more, we're seeing that consumers are really interested in where their food's coming from and how it's raised. And this is especially true of farm animal welfare issues, which has seen a really impressive rise in the public consciousness. 84% uh, of consumers view better living conditions for farm animals as either important or very important. And 74% of consumers are paying more attention to welfare labels now than they were just five years ago. And welfare certifications are particularly appealing to consumers because they're really easy. It's kind of a simple one-stop shop. Instead of having to figure out what all those, you know, dozens of other confusing labels out there mean, cage-free, natural, consumers can just look for the certification label and know that the animals are being raised to higher standards. That's really appealing to them. In addition to this increasing consumer demand for certification that we're seeing, over the past year we've seen a really a large number of companies that are committing to source welfare certified products. 
We've seen food service companies like Compass Group, Aramark, Bon Appetit, and Sodexo. They've all made commitments along with restaurants like Panera, Shake Shack, Chipotle, Starbucks, which are really just a handful of the commitments that we've seen, and we expect to see more to come. Plus, on top of these commitments, there's already a number of restaurants that are already sourcing from welfare certified producers and will almost certainly continue to do so into the future. So as this consumer and corporate interest in farm animal welfare has risen, so has the media coverage of this issue. Um, this coverage really has included a significant amount of public education around welfare certifications, with the vast majority of publications ultimately recommending AWA, Certified Humane, and GAP is the most meaningful certifications available in the marketplace. In fact, just this week, the New York Times released an article entitled What to Make of Those Animal Welfare Labels on Meat and Eggs that explicitly referenced all three certifications detailing what really makes them stand out from the pack. Uh, the article also links to the ASPCA's own consumer campaign, which points consumers to AWA, Certified Humane, and GAP and really encourages them to look for these certifications whenever possible and offers a number of resources to help them find them. So on top of all this demand and public education, welfare certification offers farmers access to markets they might not have been able to participate in without certification. One that we find is of particular interest to a lot of farmers is access to whole foods markets. All the meat that's sold in the whole foods has to be certified under the GAP program. However, Whole Foods isn't the only market you would gain access to. As I mentioned before, we've got large companies committing certification, many of which have these corresponding commitments to sourcing locally when possible. Uh, lots of high-end restaurants already are sourcing from welfare certified farms, uh, often citing the superior quality of their products. And additionally, more and more school districts and cities, um, which we like to call kind of super consumers, who are really obviously buying a lot of food, are committing to a program called the Good Food Purchasing Program, which requires a certain percentage of all food purchases to come from welfare certified farms. Plus, welfare certified farmers have access to this growing base of conscious consumers who are proactively seeking out and really willing to pay more for welfare certified products. Welfare certifications add value to your products, um, with we've seen certified farmers reporting earning um, double-digit premiums, which again is really well explained in our case studies, and I recommend you take a look. Um, but now that we've talked a bit about kind of the whys of certification, I'm going to turn it over to Jamie to cover more of the hows and talk us through the certification process. Thanks, Kara. Um, <clears throat> so this is Jamie again, um, and I'm going to talk through what the certification process actually looks like. Um, and I'm not going to focus on any one program in particular. Instead, because the major steps of each of these program certification processes are actually similar, I'm going to describe each of those steps in fairly general terms. And I encourage you to go to the guide to understand the details or nuances of each individual program's process. So in terms of the major steps of getting certified, um, they're, they're listed out on your screen now, and um, I'll, I'll sort of read through them and then explain uh, each one. So first, obviously, and this is part of what you're doing now, I uh, suspect, um, you do your homework to figure out you know, whether a welfare certification program is right for you and which program is right for you. Um, once you make that determination, if you want to move forward, you submit a written application to one of the programs. Uh, as a next step, the program, uh, or in the case of GAP, an outside auditing company, uh, conducts an audit or inspection of your farm. And then if you meet the program's requirements, uh, you get program certification. And along with certification come rights to use that program's labels and logos in your marketing, and uh, depending on the program, varying levels of marketing support. Um, and then finally, as Kara will discuss, uh, you have to take periodic steps to maintain your certification. So <clears throat> in terms of doing your homework, um, you know, we recommend that you basically start by looking into each certification program to again see which of these, if any, are a good fit for you. And a uh, primary consideration is who are you? Are, are you a farm? Are you a producer group uh, or part of a producer group? Are you a marketing group or a retailer? 
uh, does the program cover the kind of entity that you are? Um, and put another way, are you eligible or the right party to be pursuing certification? Another huge consideration for you is what species do the programs cover? For example, uh, American Welfare Approved, which I'll just refer to as AWA, covers ducks and geese and the other programs do not. Uh, likewise, only AWA and Certified Humane cover dairy cattle and dairy goats. GAP does not. Uh, another consideration is cost. So for example, AWA is free, Certified Humane has an application fee, an audit fee, and a certification fee uh, that's based on the amount of product processed or the amount of animal products sold. Uh, GAP, on the other hand, has no application fee or certification fee, uh, but has audit fees um, that range in amounts from uh, those of Certified Humane. Uh, and GAP also charges by the case for retail-ready products that contain GAP-certified meat ingredients. So um, another main consideration, you know, are what, what are the program standards, obviously? Uh, are the standards workable for your business? What are the program's record-keeping requirements? Uh, can you afford to physically, you know, if necessary, retrofit any aspects of your farm to meet program standards? Another factor might be, you know, what do the programs offer in terms of market access? and technical support. And these are two different issues. Um, you know, first, what markets are you producing and selling within? And will this particular certification help you distinguish yourself in that market? And then secondly, um, what actual technical marketing support or marketing materials will the program provide you? So in the big picture, there are many factors to consider, obviously. Um, and one of the main purposes of this guide is to really help you see what some of those major factors are and think through them. Uh, and as Kara mentioned, we do this in a quick way in an overview chart on page seven, and you're looking at part of that right now. Uh, we do it in a slightly more detailed way uh, with charts that compare program standards across species, as Kara mentioned. And then in the guide, we give an in-depth overview of each of the programs, and as Kara mentioned, case studies uh, where you're really hearing from farmers who are participating in the programs about their experiences doing that. Um, and at the end of the guide, uh, if you determine that you're interested in learning more about one program or another, uh, we direct you to the program's own resources, so the program's own policy manuals, the program's contact information, so that you can get all the details you need uh, and so that you have an avenue for asking all of your questions. Um, <clears throat> and all that said, I just want to step back for a second and say that many of the farmers who um, I spoke with in uh, developing the case studies for this guide mentioned that when they first encountered all of the program rules and standards, whatever the program was, they felt really overwhelmed. There were just you know, many pages of standards and uh, maybe record re keeping requirements that uh, would be new to them. Um, but at the end of the day, those farmers obviously found it worth it um, and reported that the programs were generally really supportive of them and answering their questions about program requirements and not just when they were first applying to the programs but after being certified as well. So excuse me, this is all just to say uh, when you're looking into these programs and get into the weeds, expect that you might feel a little bit overwhelmed uh, when first reviewing how the program works and what it requires. Uh, and our recommendation is just that you settle into your favorite reading spot and start with our guide. Uh, and then as I mentioned, if a program interests you, follow the links in the guide to those program resources to get uh, in depth, um, more in-depth coverage on species-specific program standards. So after you've done your homework, um, and uh, obviously a big chunk of your homework is uh, looking at bottom lines and making business determinations and um, uh, you apply. And so um, if you determine that a program is right for you, um, generally all of the programs require a written application uh, that you can submit in hard copy or online. Uh, and the applications generally um, you know, ask you questions about your farm, your animals, your production systems. And we cover applications in more detail in the guide. I just want to note two things about them here. First, each program has a confidentiality policy so that the information you provide to the program is generally kept between you and the program. And the second thing I'll note is that some programs have application fees and some don't.
So next, after the program reviews your application, uh, the program contacts you to schedule an audit. And I want to pause here to acknowledge that, um, to me anyway, audit is generally a scary word. Um, when I hear audit, I think IRS. Uh, I think of a process that's meant to catch you lying and penalize you with criminal or monetary sanctions. Um, so I would encourage you to think of welfare certification audits as a slightly different breed. Um, the point of these audits, which Certified Humane calls inspections, um, is just to confirm that your farm meets the program standards and to identify where it doesn't so that you know what you need to change in order to receive or maintain certification. And the farmers we spoke with who participated in these programs identified audits as being fairly painless procedures um, and said that they'd often have little things wrong here and there in terms of not meeting standards, uh, but that they felt supported by the programs and understanding how to fix those things. And several of the farmers we cover in our case studies, um, and you'll hear this from the farmers if you read the case studies, felt like the program standards and the audits themselves um, actually helped them uh, learn about animal husbandry practices um, and, and sort of how to improve their practices, uh, which they saw to benefit the animals. Um, and they were interested in learning about that anyway. So, what does an inspection process or audit actually look like? Um, so generally speaking, uh, for each program, uh, a person from the program, uh, or in GAP's case, uh, a person from an independent audit company visits your farm. Typically the audit lasts half a day to a day, depending on the size of your operation and the number of sites you have. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, they start by sitting down, uh, generally speaking. Um, again, I'm generalizing across programs. Um, all audits cover similar things. So um, start by sitting down with the farm manager to go over what they're going to do that day, to answer any questions you have, uh, and then they go about their audit. So they might start by asking the farm manager about the farm itself, um, what animals are there and how they're kept. Um, and at some point after sort of collecting orally uh, high-level information about the operations, uh, they'll review documents um, that are relevant to their standards, um, like documents reflecting where the animals came from, uh, what they're fed, uh, documents reflecting their medical treatment. And inside the guide for each program, we offer a little bit more information about the kinds of records or documents that auditors are interested in looking at. Um, and just as a side note, um, some farmers reported um, that they had to sort of put existing policies in writing to satisfy program requirements, um, like having a farm management plan or having emergency procedures. But I talked to many folks who said, I was already doing that. I just had to put it in writing um, for, the, for the program or to meet program standards. So after looking at uh, records and documents, um, the programs will observe the facilities and the animals. So in terms of the animals, they'll look at the animal's physical condition, and the practices involved in raising them. And at the end of sort of the observation of the facilities and the animals, there's an exit interview. Um, and again, this is, this is true for each of the programs. And in the exit interview, uh, the auditor meets with the farm manager to basically summarize their findings and highlight any aspect of the farm that they think doesn't comply with program standards. Um, and that's, that's for both of your benefit uh, in terms of understanding what would have to happen next for certification. So uh, after the audit, if there's something, that, uh, something about your farm that doesn't meet a program standard, uh, you'd receive a, a written sort of notice of areas that need or would need improvements to meet standards. Um, and you have a, a certain period of time to essentially provide the program with a proposed course of corrective action, like what it is that you plan to do um, to meet the program standard. And generally, once you've corrected any issues, the program certifies you. So um, the guide goes over the audit process for each program in detail. So if you have questions about how specific program audits or inspections work, consult the guide, and then, of course, contact the program with any questions. So this brings us to the next major step, which is certification itself. So uh, assuming all goes well with the audit or 
uh, minor corrections are made, uh, or in some cases major corrections are made if you deem that it's uh, worth it uh, financially um, in terms of how you're planning to leverage your um, participation in the program in, in, the, uh, in the business, um, in, in your marketing. Uh, once you receive your certification, you're able to use the program label and logo in your marketing and on your products. Um, and you're also able to benefit from any marketing support the program provides. And one important note here, uh, as we address in the guide, before you use a label or logo on any of your products from these programs, you do have to fill out a relatively brief application for approval to the USDA. Um, but that application process is brief and it's also covered in the guide. So that's certification in a nutshell. Um, and I'm going to turn it back to Kara to talk about requirements uh, to maintain certification. And then after that, she'll uh, shift gears and talk about funding opportunities in terms of uh, getting funding to support your efforts to uh, meet program standards. Thanks, Jamie. Um, so this last step is, is really pretty simple and straightforward. Um, really simple things like making sure that you're staying on top of all of these record keeping requirements that Jamie was referencing throughout the year, staying on top of that paperwork so it's not kind of a scramble at the end of the year that's just going to make it more difficult. Um, and also, of course, that you know, on a yearly basis you're complying with the annual audit and all of those requirements. Um, but it's also uh, important to keep in mind that you need to be reporting any kind of substantive, sub substantive changes that occur on your farm. Um, you need to report those to the program. And examples of this kind of change might be something like changing the type or amount of the certified products that you're offering, or if you've made some significant changes to either your management or organizational structure, you'd want to report that. And then, of course, the more obvious changes should also be reported. You know, if you stop raising a particular type of animal, they're going to want to let the certification know. Uh, but maybe most importantly is really that farmers should take advantage of all the marketing and technical assistance that's offered by the certification program that they've chosen. Um, you'll see on this slide here uh, we pulled out some of from the guide, the section on the marketing support that AWA provides, and each um, program really offers a, a variety of it. But again, there's all kinds of things. AWA has a guide to how to market your your uh, products using social media. Um, a lot of them offer promotional materials if you want to hand out to your customers or if you're going to conferences, you want to bring it so people know, anything like that. And also a lot of them uh, offer technical advice. So if you're ever having any kind of issue on your farm, you know, they can help you figure that out. Um, truly, at the end of the day, the certification programs want you and your farm to succeed. So it makes just sense to utilize all of their resources to help you do that. So finally, we're going to switch gears here and talk about funding opportunities for farmers. Uh, the certification guide goes through and identifies some examples of funding from a variety of different sources. So that includes from companies, from nonprofits, and also from federal and state uh, programs. So downstream subsidies refer to the money that can be filtered down to farmers from producers or marketers that are buying their products. Uh, these buyers are often willing to subsidize the cost of becoming certified since they're the ones who are going to be selling your value-added product. One of our GAP case studies, actually a cattle rancher in Maine, provides a really great example of, of how this type of funding can be worked out. There's also a few... And I'll just add to the... That, yeah, yeah, go ahead, Jamie. Sorry, Kara, can I just jump in? Yeah, I just want to add that um, yeah. another one of the case studies on, on Mary's chicken... Um, uh, provides an example of a case where um, a farm paid not just for the certification of its supplier farms, but also um, on-farm physical retrofits that that those supplier farms had to undertake to conform with program standards. Uh, and then it was in the business benefit of Mary's Chicken uh, to make sure that its supplier farms conformed with program standards, um, which which was required by broader program. Um, which was a program standard in and of itself, that the supplier farms meet program standards. So uh, anyway, it's, there's opportunity not just to get certification costs covered, but uh, depending on the supply chain that you're a part of or potentially a part of, also uh, actually costs of making on-farm changes to meet program requirements. 
Yeah, thanks for that, Jamie. That's definitely important. Um, again, there's kind of this basically a trickle down that can happen and can be really helpful for farmers. So that's something to look into if you're considering getting certified and are in some kind of, you know, train um, with either a marketer or another producer group. Um, so there's also, moving on, a few nonprofit organizations that offer funding to farms. FACT is the most obvious of these. Um, and they offer a grant that's specifically now for farmers who are looking to become welfare certified. Um, however, there aren't a lot of nonprofit organizations that are granting specifically the higher welfare farmers, which is why we also made a point to identify different federal and state grant programs that are available. So these government programs aren't aimed specifically at, at higher welfare, welfare certified farmers, but they offer support in other ways that are likely applicable. So a great example of this is the Federal Value Added Grants Program. This program offers grant money to producers that are looking to expand the market for their value added products. And in the past, they've given money to welfare certified farms. Um, so that's a really great option. And there's actually a lot of state grant programs that will match a portion of a federal grant that you've received. So these, these value added grants are a really great place to start looking for and sometimes you know major funding up to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for farms. So this that's a lot of money. And again, especially if you can get a federal grant and combine it with a state uh, matching grant, that's a really great option for for farmers. Um, but in addition, the guide also identifies a number of kind of conservation based and environmental focused grant programs that again they're not they're not aiming for higher welfare farmers necessarily, but that a lot of pasture based farmers are likely to qualify for. And these are generally focusing on conservation systems and improvements to water and soil and land quality, as well as different waste management techniques. So again, even though they're not necessarily directly on, on topic, they're definitely worth looking into because you might qualify anyways. Um, and in general, I really encourage everyone to peruse kind of their own State Department of Agriculture's website and take a look at the programs that they offer for farmers. Uh, what we've identified in the guide isn't an an exhaustive list, it's, it's not all 50 states or anything, but it really provides a good example of programs that exist in some states, and it's worth taking a look at those before looking at your own grants and seeing if any are similar, um, because again, that'll be a really great place to start and, and look at and consider applying to those. And then of course, everyone should consider applying to a, to a grant for that. Um, so with that, actually we've made it through all the information. Um, thanks to everyone who gave up their lunch break to join us on this webinar. We hope that you've learned a lot about welfare certification. And a big thanks to FACT for hosting. Again, the guide's available online at that link, which I saw has also been shared in the chat box. And with that, I think we'll turn to questions. Yeah, thank you, Kara and Jamie. This is Larissa again. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that um, fantastic presentation, you guys really shared a wealth of information and I think it was really clear and really helpful. Um, and we are going to get to questions in just one minute, but I wanted to do one last poll. Um, let's see if I can find where I'm to see how folks are feeling after the webinar. Um, and just know, let's see, that we do not know what your you know individual answers are. <laughs> so please, please let us know after the certification um, learning more about certification options, are you more likely to pursue certification, perhaps the same or less likely? Again, we just have a composite uh, kind of per percentile that we, we, we know, we don't know what individuals vote. I'll give it another minute or so. The votes are rolling in. Yeah, it looks like the majority of people are more likely uh, to pursue certification. So, all right, we are ready to take your questions. Um, if you would, please type into the chat bar on the left side of your screen, and I will read the questions for um, Jamie and or Kara to answer. <clears throat> and I actually have one that I'll just start off with as people are typing in. I noticed on one of the um, charts, and I didn't, this might not be a question, but more of an observation, but um, when we were talking about costs, that uh, if a farm were to pass the AWA audit, that you can also apply, apply it for a certified humane. And that was something I wasn't aware of. Um, is there anything else to add about that little tidbit, Kara or Jamie? 
Um, not much, Ed, but you're right. That's something that a lot of people aren't aware of, and that can just, again, be helpful to know. Um, but, yeah, so if you if you already have passed an AWA audit, you can apply for, you know, an equivalency without having to, therefore, pay the audit and certification fees for certified humane. If you're getting two labels for significantly less money. So. Yeah, it's, it seems like a really, a really good option if you can um, meet all of the AWA standards. We have a question. Also, just, um, just to jump oh, in, um, yes. I was going to say while we're waiting for questions to come in, um, I would just really plug again the case studies in the guide so you can hear from different uh, farms and ranches around the country um, how participating in these programs was helpful to them um, and beneficial to them in a business context and um, sort of the uh, their experiences you know, getting certified, why they made the decisions they made, challenges they encountered along the way, um, what the ultimate financial benefit was to their company for having done it, and things like that. And I, I would just assume that it's it's helpful for, for you all to hear uh, from a range of folks, um, both in terms of kind and size of operation and geography, uh, about uh, the benefits of, of participating and, and, and not just hearing it from us. Yeah, thank you, Jamie, for adding that. Um, so we know that there is a, um, a an online version of the guide. Do you all have hard copies of the guide? And if so, how are they available? That's one question from Robert. Yeah, we do have hard copies, and they're available by, I will enter into the chat, there is an email address that you can email and request a guide, and we will send one to you. It's farm animal welfare at ASPCA.org. But again, no. <laughs> Excellent. So we have a question from Jen in Wisconsin. Is there a benefit to having both the AWA audit and the certified uh, humane certification, or is it redundant? Jamie or Kara, if you'd like to feel that one on your, I guess it'd be more of an opinion. Um, yeah, I mean. Kara, do you want to I, speak to that? You're right in that. It, <laughs> Yeah, um, I think that just the fact that there are a number of farms that do have multiple certifications proves that there's a benefit. Um, a good example of this is a farm called White Oak Pastures, which has a really great reputation, and they actually have all three certifications. Um, and obviously, with the GAP certification, it makes sense to have it if you ever want to sell into Whole Foods. You can see the benefit of having perhaps that and an AWA certification. But um, plenty of people have, have both. Um, and this, again, it, it increases the odds that someone's going to recognize at least one of the labels. So there's certainly that point. If they if they haven't seen the animal welfare food label, odds are they've used certified humane or, or one or the other. So it doubles the chance of them recognizing you as being higher welfare. Do you have anything to add, Jamie? Um, I would just add that uh, one of the farmers in the case studies uh, who raises beef cattle um, talks uh, in the case study about how, uh, from his perspective and experience, um, you know, the industry that, that he's in is, you know, you're either a high volume, low profit margin producer or low volume, higher profit margin producer. Um, and he's a lower volume, higher profit margin producer. And uh, he's he's pointing directly to his certification as helpful justification for the higher profit margins. And one of the things that he's been considering is whether getting additional certifications like organic, et cetera, um, would add any value in terms of helping justify existing profit margin or um, increasing profit margins. And so uh, the takeaway for me was that that's, that's sort of a subjective and uh, subjective decision and, and business calculation, depending on the market that you're you're targeting. Thank you, Jamie. Um, question from Teresa in Wisconsin as well. On average, how long does it usually take to get certification? I imagine that could range. <laughs> yeah. That's correct. It totally it very much depends on what kind of state you're at on your farm before you apply. If you're already meeting all the standards and it really is kind of just, you know, getting them down on paper and applying, it could take 
think as little as, I mean, it's really going to depend on how early they can get an auditor out to you. That tends to be what's going to take the longest because they have to schedule that person and they might have to travel to you. So maybe conservative the shortest amount of time, I think maybe two months. Jamie, does that sound about right? It does. Um, it's a good question, and, I'm, and I don't know the answer off my off the top of my head. And that would be a great question uh, to call a program and, and ask. But certainly, the main point is that it's going to range widely, depending again on where you're at from the start. If you have to be transitioning your farm or retrofitting anything, it's obviously going to take a bit longer. So. Thank you, Kara. Um, we have a question from Robert. This is directed to ASPCA. Um, will local ASPCA chapters help certified farms market their products? I don't know if you've gotten that question before or not. Um, I have a feeling that the local chapters that Robert is referring to are actually just kind of the local SPCAs, which are yeah. not actually affiliated with us. But at a national level, I can just speak to that the ASPCA does a huge number, amount of marketing for certified farmers. Again, I spoke to our consumer education campaign that we do. Um, so we have all kinds of resources for consumers, and we encourage them to pledge to, you know, look for certified products and only buy them, you know, if possible. And part of those resources um, includes a state-by-state -state list of all the welfare certified farms. So for people particularly who are looking to, you know, directly buy from the farmer, they can go to our website click whichever state they live in, and then all those farms will be listed there. So that's a pretty helpful form of marketing, I would say. And um, also just to point out that the ASPCA has 2.5 million members, so our reach is pretty expansive. Excellent. Uh, question from Megan in New York City. She says, I work for a meat distributor distributor who is now requiring AWA and certified humane certification for beef, pork, and lamb farmers. What are additional considerations we must take um, in the certification process or uh, on the USDA FSIS label approval process? Jamie or Kara? I know that there, there sure, was I have a, a general response. If, if, you have a, yeah. if you have a specific response, go ahead. No, go for it, Jamie. Um, I was just going to say I, it's a it's it's a great question. Um, without knowing more about, um, you know, what what you're doing and whether you're pursuing certifications on behalf of those farms um, or whether the farms are already certified, um, and whether you're pursuing the label approval process or the farms have already pursued it, um, I suppose the outcome is different, but. I would just point you to contacting the programs yourself with that exact question um, uh, to sort of explain the um, business structure and, and how it's working and, and whether there are, are you know, additional considerations um, based on how it is that you're operating and what it is that you're trying to achieve. Yeah, and I'll just point again that the, the guide is really um, focused obviously on farmers, but, but that the programs do certify, like yourself would be a, a marketing group. I assume that's how you would kind of qualify. So they have different um, requirements for those. So again, you just want to, whichever, if it's certified main or animal welfare approved, um, just contact them and reach out and let them know. Again, if, if your entire supply chain is, is certified, um, and it's just a matter of getting that label, say, on your website or anything like that, they should be able to help you through that. And another consideration is, um, you know, the nature of the supplier farms in the sense that, for example, AWA um, is a certification program uh, for which only, uh, quote, unquote, family farms are eligible. So, uh, you know, I... One question is, do the farms meet those standards, um, et cetera? So again, I think a question for the, the programs themselves. Thank you guys on that. Do we have any other questions? I have not, um, I think we've gotten through all the ones that have been, uh, been asked so far. Um, so if you do have, your question, have a question, now is your chance before we end the webinar. Of course, we, there will be an opportunity um, 
after the, the webinar closes that if something does occur to you, um, you can always ask a follow-up question. <clears throat> okay, we have uh, a question from Jen in Wisconsin. Which of the, uh, uh, in follow-up, is there an equivalent, oh, sorry, that's a different question, from Jen, which of the three is the most popular and recognized in Wisconsin and Illinois, she asks. Do you have any insight on that, Kara Jamie? Um, you know, I don't have particular state-by-state -state info about that. Um, I think it is fair to say in terms of what's most widely available in the larger um, grocery stores would be um, certified humane. Again, just because animal welfare approved tends to be smaller farms, you're not going to be finding their products in, you know, the Hannafords and Safeways of the world necessarily. So uh, in, in that way, certified humane is probably the most well-recognized because you can find their products. One of our case studies is Pete and Jerry's eggs. You know, they're really widely available in large grocery stores um, across the East Coast. So on that alone, I'd say that certified humane might be the most recognized in that sense. But at this point, all again, all three of them are really recognized as being meaningful. So. Um, Follow-up question from Megan, the, the meat distributor in, in New York. Um, is there an equivalent... Uh, 7234-1 form for distributors. Do you know of anything like that, Jamie or Kira? Or is that something we could kind of follow up with um, offline? Okay. It's a good so question. Now um, this is what she was getting at. Yeah. Um, Jamie, I don't know. Uh, for me personally, the 72341 form is specifically, again, for FSIS covers the labeling of meat products. So I think as a distributor, you wouldn't fall into that um, kind of oversight, it would actually be a marketing oversight, which wouldn't even be that um, department. So I don't think that there is an equivalent form through the FSIS, at least. Would you agree, Jamie? And I would only add, I would only add to that that um, you could contact the U.S. Department of Agriculture's um, Food Safety and Inspection Service to confirm that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which Excellent. we, if you download the guide, we have links to all the, that's linked in the guide, so we'll take you right there. Um, question about FACTS grants. I'll talk to you just briefly. Can you be considered for a FACT grant, a grant from FACT, while transitioning your farm to meet AWA requirements? And that's, I will say that every year we kind of tweak the, um, the guidelines on who's eligible, who's not. But um, yes, in the past, uh, that is absolutely um, an appropriate kind of project, especially if you're applying for a certification grant and your project is, you know, intent is to help you with that certification. We wouldn't expect you to be um, certified ahead of time. Uh, question about the webinar, this recording will be available. Um, the, the actual, you know, audio and visual, um, I will be sending out a link and also a link to the slides themselves. And I will also send a link to, um, the guide so that you can download that if you'd like. Um, uh, I think it would probably be by tomorrow. Usually it takes a little while to, to process um, the recordings, but I will definitely be sharing that soon. Um, any other questions at this point? <laughs> yeah, it's been, it's been lovely to have everyone with us today. Um, I should also note that I'm going to uh, archive this webinar on our website, so you'll be able to access it um, at any point and share it with others. Um, and if you would be so kind, uh, if you would please take a few minutes after this webinar closes to complete a survey, it's just a couple questions. You can also sign up to receive Fund a Farmer email updates so that you will learn about um, future webinars, scholarship and grant opportunities. We do have a whole bunch of webinars coming up um, in February and in March, kind of the, the winter season. If you can't get to any conferences, then you know please join us for a webinar or one, two or all of them. Um, a sincere thank you again to Kara and Jamie for your excellent presentation and taking the time to you know, answer all these questions. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of your day. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.